Everybody knows the history of the Chevelle, but in my mind, the ultimate Chevelle is a 70SS LS6. In my opinion, I think it's the best looking car. You know, you had the headlights, you had the blacked out grille, the big SS emblem, the optional cowl hood, the black stripes, the polyglass tires, the wheels. It had a great look to it. It was actually a really nice run and driving car full frame on the car, not like a Camaro with a subframe, so it floated a little bit more. Maybe it didn't handle quite as good, but the ride was really, really nice with this car. Then it comes down to performance. Well, you had a 396, you had an L89 with aluminum heads, you had the 454 LS5, but the big dog was the LS6. What made the LS6 so special is the horsepower. 450 horsepower, 500 foot-pounds of torque. It was the biggest, highest horsepower engine they ever put in a Chevy. It's a great running piece, and it's one of those cars that it doesn't matter what gear you're in, if you stomp on the pedal, it works. So 4,475 guys ordered the LS6, but you also had to order an SS by the time you were out the door, if you wanted an LS6, you were almost $1,000 more, and the base car, remember, was about 3,000 bucks, so 25% more to ultimately get the LS6. So here's the visual differences. You had a low-rise aluminum intake, you had an 800 Holley sitting on top, you had a solid lifter camshaft, unlike the LS5, and pretty lumpy cam, 520 lift, 316 duration, you know, and a fairly big valve in there. The intake valve was a 219. And here's a little tidbit, I still remember when I was in high school, I used to race a Boss 302 on the street, and one of the guys I used to run against had this LS6, and I had a giant 567 gear. I had to spin that thing 8,000 RPM to just keep up with this LS6, and he'd barely spin at 5,500. But to give you an idea, the intake valve on this is a 219, the intake valve on a 70 Boss 302 is also a 219 out of a 302 cubic inch. Just a total side note, but they had monster heads on those things as well, but you needed huge RPM to make those work. These ones were torque monsters. You were making 500 foot-pounds of torque, mid 3,000 RPM. Steel crank and rods, 11.25 to one forged piston. You needed good gas. I mean, even today, we can't run these things on pump gas unless the compression ratio has been brought down. You need good fuel, and they'll ping their heads off if you get into it without good fuel. You can always retard the timing, it helps a little bit, but the reality is if you want one of these motors the way it ran back in the day, you need some good gas. The other thing that restricted these engines was the manifolds and the AIR smog pumps were terrible. Everybody took them off. This engine actually has the smog pump off of it. You can see where the plugs are here. That would help a little bit, but what really helped this car is a set of headers. Out of the box with a set of 14 inch polyglass, these cars ran roughly 1320s. As soon as you uncork the exhaust, put a good set of headers on it, put a little bit of a tire on it, you were well into the mid to low 12s. These things really worked, and like I said, they were a torque monster. I think one of the coolest things on a 70 Chevelle is the cowl plenum hood. Obviously, it goes right over the air cleaner, and it was actually the NASCAR guys that understood that there was a lot of pressure right here at the base of the windshield, and Chevy took advantage of it with the cowl hoods, whether it was a 69 Camaro or the 70 cowl hood. All of the pressure is here, they're ramming that into the engine. It's a cool thing too, when you get on it and you see that flapper lift up, it's one of the neat things about driving one of these cars. The interior on these cars, one of the few cars that I really like with a bench seat. And it didn't matter if you ordered an automatic or a stick, the standard seat was a bench seat. I think it looks really cool with the stick, it's one of the few cars. Now the trainee to get in one of these was an M22, a rock crusher. The reason it was called a rock crusher is because it just growled like there was a bunch of rocks in the trainee. It was one of the toughest transmissions Chevrolet ever built. As far as performance goes, the stick and the automatic ran roughly the same quarter mile times. The stick obviously is more valuable today, especially if it's an M22. The automatics, like I say, are coming on, but if it's an automatic, it almost has to be a floor shift to bring any big dollars.
One of the unique things about a 70 SS is this rear bumper pad, unique only to that car. It's got the little white trim in there in the SS. It's glued on to a regular bumper. And what's cool on this car is this car was sold new by Berger. It adds a little bit of value to the car. Berger obviously had great race history. They were a dealership that sold a lot of performance cars. If the 70 LS6 Chevelle is the big dog, the really big dog is this in a convertible version. So the convertible LS6 is really the big dog. An exact same specs as far as horsepower, performance, options, you know, all of the things are exactly the same. The big difference is the convertible top. Now they made LS6s in convertibles, in coupes, and in El Caminos. Problem is GM never kept the exact number and there's always been this controversy, how many LS6s did they build in convertibles? There's numbers of 19, there's numbers of 50, there's numbers all over the board. Probably the most accurate way to decipher what's probably realistic is if you took total production of all the Chevelles and then you broke them down into percentages. If you take total production of LS6s, there's 4,475. Then if you take all of the Chevelles basically built, you had 86% were coupes, 2% were convertibles, and 12% were El Caminos. So if you extrapolate that to LS6s, that means you had 3,840 coupes, you had 95 convertibles, and you had 540 El Caminos. So this is roughly one of a hundred. Again, nobody's got the exact numbers. If they tell you they do, they're lying. So it comes down to value. And really, the value of these cars comes down to the paperwork. There's lots of fake LS6s roaming around. There's lots of fake convertibles, coupes, all of the above. Paperwork is king for one of these cars. But let's assume the paperwork is right. A great coupe with great options, it's an M22, it's great colors, it's Fathom Blue, you know, it's the right car. Today is probably 150 to 200,000. We've seen a bunch of great cars bring those sorts of numbers. Convertibles are probably somewhere between 400 dollars and $600,000 for the right car with the right options, the right quality of restoration. And El Caminos, almost the same as the coupes. I would say you're gonna be in that $150,000 range. Maybe not as desirable, but certainly rarer than a coupe. But the problem is, is you don't have as many guys willing to buy those cars. So let's look at some of the paperwork that makes sure these cars are real LS6 cars. So we have two different LS6s here. We have the Berger car, the white coupe, and the paperwork we have with that is two build sheets. And the build sheets here tell you all the options that that car came with. This is a really important piece of paperwork. Sometimes it's under the seat, sometimes it's under the carpet. There's various places you're gonna find this. The other piece of paperwork that you could get is a protecto plate, an original invoice, a window sticker, but these tend to be the real deals, the build sheets, where some of those other things can be faked fairly easily. This is a tough piece of paperwork to fake. You can see here all the options that car came with, the colors, all of that. Even a better piece of paperwork is like for the gold convertible, and this is truly bulletproof paperwork, is the GM of Canada paperwork. And again, there's a partial build sheet for this car. So the cars that got imported into Canada, GM kept all the records. And they kept the records on a microfiche. And this would have been the microfiche that you had with all the records. And then they extrapolate from here, give you this nice, easy to read piece of paper. It comes right from GM. So it tells you the date we ordered the paperwork, the colors, the options, the shipping date, the selling dealer when it was new, and then all of the options here. The big option obviously here is the convertible top right here, which would be the CO6 code. One of the things that speak louder in the paperwork is the exhaust. There's nothing that sounds better than a 70s muscle car. And this is exactly the way it would have sounded back in the day. This is a totally stock engine. It's got a Gardner exhaust system, which is as close to a GM exhaust that you're ever going to find. So this is what they sounded like if you were on the dealer's lot in 1970.
Cal works a little better when you're outside and actually under load, but it's a cool package. It's one of the nicest cars that that whole muscle car era ever produced. And I think out of the Chevelles, by far my favorite, hands down.